Good evening, everyone. My name is Tim Johnson, and I'm the CEO of Mayo Clinic Health System, Franciscan Healthcare. It's nice to see you all this evening. Welcome. Uh, it's a special evening to talk about um, the Gospel of Life celebration, and we are very honored to have Bishop Callahan here, and thank you, Bishop, for saying Mass for us a little earlier. We're honored to have Deacon Dan Gannon, who's going to be the main presenter. And it's my job to introduce Christopher Ruff, and all I have to say about Christopher is that he's the director of the Office of Ministries and Social Concerns of the Diocese. So he's also our MC. so welcome, Christopher. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, and uh, thank you so much to uh, uh, Mayo, let's get the whole name right here, Mayo Clinic Health System Franciscan Healthcare, it's always a mouthful, but thank you so much, you've spoiled us here, and you've set the bar pretty high, I think, at our next event, I don't know, I don't know how we're going to possibly match what you've done with the wonderful spread and, and all of it, and it's great to see such a full house. So on behalf of the diocese, which is a co co-sponsor this event that I'd, I'd like to welcome you to and I'm sure Bishop will as well and in fact uh, I would say that our Bishop Bishop Callahan uh, I would put him up against any bishop in this country for uh, for his dedication to uh, a Catholic vision uh, the beauty of that Catholic vision in health care and the dignity of the human person we're very very proud of that and I'd like to introduce to you Bishop Callahan nice to be with you tonight folks thank you thank you I'm sure you're gonna hear uh, you know about a, a hundred times thank you for coming out uh, tonight and um, with us tonight uh, are, uh, are people from all over this uh, magnificent diocese of ours you know the the Diocese of La Crosse covers 19 counties and covers 15,000 square miles so tonight, while we are here safely ensconced in La Crosse, uh, I want to welcome our brothers and sisters in Eau Claire who are with us at St. James the Greater Parish, and our brothers and sisters in Marshfield who are with us at Our Lady of Peace Parish, and our brothers and sisters who are with us in Wausau at St. Michael's. We, had a, we have a really great turnout at these events when we, when we do this simulcast. So this is a, uh, this is a really uh, a new thing for us. We are, we are gradually coming into the, uh, the 21st century. So it's, uh, it's good. It's good for us to be here. Folks, um, there's going to be some wonderful things that you're going to hear tonight from, uh, from Deacon Dan Gannon. And uh, it's, it's so significant that, that things are happening here uh, at, uh, at the Catholic Hospital in La Crosse because we're working hard to, uh, to maintain the integrity of the Catholic health care system throughout the diocese. This is not easy to do. This is not easy to do. This is not easy for us as, as professionals who are involved both uh, in terms of trying to, to, to maintain the, the Catholicity, if you will, of, of our system, but it is also not easy for those who have the opportunity and the obligation to maintain the technology and the, the importance of maintaining what goes on in the medical community. We've had many meetings about various kinds of things that affect the particular quality of, of our Catholic health care. 
So as we make our way through these, these various kinds of, of opportunities, tonight we want to talk about the significance of end-of-life care and the importance of what that means for us on, on many different levels. But uh, we want to address that. But of course, you know, we don't necessarily want uh, especially now since our Holy Father has kind of, of opened so many different opportunities for us, we want to be able to look at the possible ways in which we can better dialogue and better maintain the quality of the care that we offer, the sense of understanding the importance and the dignity of human life from the beginning to the end as God intends, and the amount of work it takes to maintain our vision for health care and our vision for the sacredness of life in a technological age that continually challenges it. And I can't begin to tell you how significant and important it is for that dialogue to continue in this diocese as well as it has been. So I am, I am deeply grateful, obviously, to, to the Franciscan Sisters uh, for their continued role and importance in, in establishing and continuing to, to sponsor uh, a hospital. But I am deeply grateful to the members of the Mayo uh, Healthcare Administration because they are indeed players. In, uh, in all of the aspects of work that we are doing in terms of maintaining that balance. For many people, as we gather together tonight, end of life care means, especially in a Catholic hospital, it means the Catholic Church wants me to stay alive at all cost. And that gets a little scary for people because they think the church doesn't understand and doesn't believe in the significance and the importance of what goes on in terms of maintenance of, of, of life after, after some serious illness or in some situations when life itself seems as though it is coming to an end. You don't quite understand that the church really wants us to be involved at all of those levels. We understand and we know that God is going to call us home. And we know where we're going. So it's important for us to kind of focus on that. But I think for many of us, it's an opportunity to, to think about who is going to run the machine, who is going to pull the plug, and who is going to be involved in taking care of me at that moment uh, when I can no longer make decisions for myself. It's important for us to think about that. My brothers and sisters, every one of us is going to die. There is no question about that. It's important for us, however, as people of faith to understand how we live until the time we die and to take advantage of all the opportunities that we have to live well until the time God calls us or to be able to triumph over those moments when difficulties and, and, uh, and, and situations may make it a little bit more difficult for us. So, as we reflect on all of these things tonight, we want to try to leave you with a message of hope we want to leave you with a message of assurance that we are trying our best to make sure that we are not just simply going to tell you that, uh, you know, that uh, your hands, that, that your lives are in the hands of others, but that we really want you to take the opportunity to think about, pray about, work through decisions that will not just happen and, uh, and take place in an emergency room or in a, an ambulance, or in an old age home, or whatever it may be. But that each and every one of us has the opportunity to be able to take time to think about, to pray about, to set up for ourselves 
methods by which we will be able to lead, to guide, to, uh, to assist those who are going to take care of us in those moments when we can't make those decisions for ourselves. The church wants you to think about that. We don't want to simply abandon ourselves to, to, to simply saying here and now, I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to take up people's time. My children live far away. I have no relatives left. That's not the way we live. How we want to live is to make sure that we are truly aware of our dignity and aware of those who are there to help us and to care for us right until our last breath. That includes our medical professionals, the doctors and the nurses, all of those people who are there. Our priests, the deacons, all of those people who are there to assist us. And all the means that are available to us to be able to die with dignity and to live with hope. Deacon Gannon has worked with me over the past year and a half or so in the thankless job of assisting in ethical matters. I asked Dan to, uh, to be able to uh, take over some of the ethical jobs and, um, and he has done so magnificently. And he has done so as part of his diaconal service. I am incredibly grateful for the great work that he has done. And he offers himself for us in many, many good ways. So I'm, I'm happy to, to be able to, uh, to be with you tonight and with him. And I hope that you will enjoy this evening and that if there are questions that you will try and, and that we will try to respond to them and answer them as best as we can. So thanks again for coming and God be with you. Thank you so much, Bishop Callahan. Um, in, uh, in thanking uh, Mayo Clinic Health System, Franciscan Healthcare, and Dr. Johnson, there were a couple of other people I wanted to thank in particular. Uh, one being Father David Kelly, who uh, made all of the preparations for the lovely mass that we had in the chapel at 6 p.m. The other being Nikki Jo Hager. And Nikki Jo, I think you're in the back there. Nikki Jo has just been a delight to work with uh, through all the process of getting this ready. And if, if you're in a beautiful setting right now, that has a whole lot to do with Nikki Jo. So uh, just a little bit before I introduce uh, Deacon Dan Gannon, just a couple of things about the schedule tonight. Uh, he's going to lead in with, with his main presentation, which will be split into two parts of about 30 minutes each with a stretch break in between. Then at 8.30, we're going to have a longer break. You have note cards at your tables and I think pens. Uh, otherwise, I hope you maybe can share pens. I believe there are pens at the table. And uh, what, you, what we want to do is take written questions, which we will collect. Now, you might even want to be writing down questions as they occur to you as we're moving through the program. Might be a little more efficient that way, too. But we'll gather those in, during that about 10-minute break and do the best we can to kind of go through and, 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 and get a substantial number of those answered, whatever we're able to do in about 20 minutes from about 8.40 to 9. Uh, so that's essentially how the, uh, how the schedule would go. So without further ado, let me introduce Deacon Dan Gannon. Again, as Bishop said, he's the Deacon of the Diocese of La Crosse. He's assigned to the Church of the Nativity of Mary uh, near Prescott. Uh, he is founding president and CEO of Catholic Senior Services of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis. Deacon Gannon, as Bishop mentioned, is also an ethicist uh, for our diocese in the service of Bishop Callahan and is active in speeding and right speaking, <laughs> speeding, I don't think so, how was the drive, how was the drive, speaking and writing <laughs> about biomedical ethics issues. Most recently, he published an article on the Moral Act and Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment in the February 2013 edition of Ethics and Medics. He assists the Minnesota Catholic Conference as well uh, as the Wisconsin Catholic Conference on end-of-life issues. 
Deacon Gannon graduated from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota with a bachelor's degree in Thomistic philosophy. He also holds a law degree from William Mitchell College of Law in St. Paul. And he's admitted to the Minnesota Bar Association. And uh, Dan and his wife, Lisa, I think Lisa's here, Lisa? There's Lisa. Dan and his wife, Lisa, have four children. So please welcome Deacon Dan Gannon as we get him all wired up here. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Well, I feel like Batman a little bit here with my utility belt. It's wonderful to, to be here with you, and I just wanted to reiterate Bishop's thanks for all the people who have made this happen. And I want to thank the Bishop for letting me be of some assistance with some of the biomedical ethics issues on end of life. I just hope that that's not a sign of how dire things really are in the diocese, but uh, I'll do my best. I, I really appreciate being here. You know, we're really going to tonight try to be fast-paced and to move through some issues that are very complicated in many ways, but what our attempt tonight is to simplify them and go through a few major aspects of church teaching regarding end of life. But first, I always like to set the context. And that context is unapologetically Catholic. The origins of the church's moral teaching on end of life. The first segment's gonna be on that. The gospel of life. And in that context, the gospel of life of John Paul II raises several threats to human dignity, to threats to human life, and we'll be touching on those in the first section. Then we're going to move into a summary of the actual teachings of the church regarding end of life. What are the key concepts? What are the key principles that are applied as one reaches end of life that we need to be aware of? And finally, we'll be talking solutions. What is the Catholic approach to making moral judgments at the end of life? The Catholic approach is one of an advanced directive and designating someone with durable power of attorney for health care, called a health care agent, a, a health proxy, lots of different ways to express that truth. But that's basically it. We're going to have a threefold movement here of context, content, and solution. And so, without further ado, what is the origin of Catholic teaching regarding end of life? Well, of course, it's God. The one holy Catholic and apostolic church the Catholic Church is the proximate origin of our concrete guidance regarding end-of-life teaching. We turn to the Church because our connection to Christ is through the Apostolic Church. And so we turn to the Church for guidance regarding these moral issues. Specifically, the Magisterium has granted that authority to interpret the natural law, the divine law of God, revelation, and communicate in a clear way to the people of God, the will of God regarding how human beings behave. Now this seems very, very basic, but if we don't approach the end of life teachings of the church and the end of life with a firm understanding of where they proceed and the fact that they're proceeding from a divine origin through the church instituted by Christ, we can be lost along the way if we don't have that confidence and that faith that these teachings are proceeding from a divine source. But I have good news for you. You will not be listening to the opinions of Deacon Gannon, neophyte that he is. I turn to the church, the church's teachings. I am here to be a conduit through which, hopefully, some clarity 
and in a simple and understandable way to enunciate the teachings of the church, the gospel of life, the great encyclical of John Paul the Great, soon to be St. John Paul II, the Declaration on Euthanasia, John Paul II's address to the International Congress, the ERDs, the Ethical and Religious Directives. How many of you know and have heard of and or have read the Ethical and Religious Directives? And there's a lot of medical professionals in this, in this crowd as well. Uh, and I'd say about a third of your hands went up. This is an important document that really gives the guiding principles for us as we look at end of life teaching. Veritatis Splendor, the splendor of truth, which talks about the objective nature of truth and intrinsic moral evils. And this is a, an important work for us in this context. And various sources like the National Catholic Bioethics Center is a wonderful resource. And of course, what our bishops have set forth, especially most recently regarding POLST. We're going to talk about that at the end uh, and, and take into account what is the insight of the Wisconsin and also the Minnesota Catholic Conference of Bishops on this issue. So hopefully this is encouraging that what we're going to be hearing tonight is the teaching of the church. Some presuppositions about our talk tonight. The natural law. The teachings of the church are based off the natural law here. We're not talking about ecclesiastical law per se. We're talking about natural law, which is inscribed on the hearts of every human being. And so what we're talking about tonight doesn't just apply to Catholics. It applies to the universal church and also the world. The natural law applies to all. The other presupposition is that the Catholic Church is guided by the Holy Spirit. Her teachings are guided by the Holy Spirit. And that truth is not subjective. And this is a little bit of John Paul II, the very Veritate Splendor. It is not subjective, that is based on my own opinion, only, but a conscience based on objective truth, as expounded by the Church. We are made for happiness. This is another presupposition. All of the church's teachings are ordered to the good of the human person and happiness. If you think about it that way, it changes it from, well, Deacon Gannon is going to go over the rules and regulations of the church tonight. Well, it's not really that so much as it is, these are the guideposts that we have through the ethical and religious directives of the church, through the gospel of life, to help guide us to happiness, to help guide us to true joy, to help guide us to meaning and suffering. This is the context, this is the gospel of life that we're going to be talking about tonight. Another presupposition is that we all tend towards the good. A little philosophy here, a little Aristotle. We all tend towards the good, but the question is, is it the apparent good or the real good? Even the bank robber who's robbing a bank thinks they're getting a good, right? But it's obviously not the true good. And so when we're talking about moral matters, we're talking about the human person's inclination towards the good. And the good is presented to us especially and is evident in God's design and pattern for us. Everything fits together. This is a, uh, this is a busy screen here. This is one I use in teaching at the Catechetical Institute in St. Paul at the seminary when I'm talking about actually the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But I thought I'd throw it up here because I like the slide. But it's got the creed and the sacramental life, the moral life and prayer in the catechism. But what I really want you to pay attention to is just the notion that our lives come from God and return to God. They come from God and return to God. It's this circle of life, if you will, where we are caught up in the paschal mystery of Christ's coming and through the entrustment of the sacrifice of Christ to the church, the love and the truth manifested by Christ, handed on through the apostles, is evident in the church's teaching about the end of life and the gospel of life. And what's the goal? The Holy Trinity. Heaven. This is how all that is temporal is ordered to the spiritual, as Pope Pius XII said. This is our goal as Catholics, is to reach that union with the Holy Trinity. So, a little quote here for you. John Paul the Great in the Gospel of Life. The Gospel of Life is a precise and vigorous reaffirmation of the value of human life and its inviolability 
and at the same time a pressing appeal addressed to each and every person in the name of God. Respect, protect, love, and serve life. Every human life. Only in this direction will you find justice, development, true freedom, peace, and happiness. Note five in the Gospel of Life. And the Gospel of Life is an integral part of that Gospel, which is Jesus Christ himself. The truth is a person, not a thing. Jesus Christ is at the center of the Gospel of Life because he has given us himself completely in the sacrifice on the cross, erasing any doubt of the value of the human person in the eyes of God. And we are at the service of this gospel, says John Paul the Great. And so this context is one of doing God's will. Jesus' healing mission, physical, mental, spiritual, in communion with the local bishop, in communion with the church, as the ethical and religious directives tell us, as pastor, the diocesan bishop is in a unique position to encourage the faithful to greater responsibility in the healing ministry of the church. Whoops. I don't need that, actually. As teacher, the diocesan bishop encourages and ensures the moral and religious integrity of the health care ministry in whatever setting it is carried out in the diocese. And this is that collaboration the bishop is talking about. The collaboration between the church with our shepherd and health care and Catholics and parishes throughout this diocese. To come together to celebrate this gospel of life that every person must protect, respect, and defend every human life. This is central to our mission as Catholics. And again, the mystery of Christ cast light on the facet, on every facet of Catholic health care. This is from the Ethical and Religious Directives. We should, you, I really encourage you to read it because it's full of pastoral teaching regarding how Catholic health care approaches the human person and the human dignity. Love is the animating principle of the gospel of life. This is all from the ERDs. Healing and compassion as a continuation of Christ's mission. Suffering as participation in the redemptive power of Christ. The greatest evil in the world is not suffering. The greatest evil in the world is sin. And so as Catholics, as we approach end of life, while it is imperative we alleviate suffering, of course we do. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But we also see a value and a meaning in suffering because we have entered into the paschal mystery of Christ's death on the cross. And as Catholics, we offer love and compassion and support in accordance with Christ's will, in accordance with the church and with the sacramental life. And finally, as Catholics, we see death as an opportunity for a final act of communion with Christ, to be transformed by our hope in the resurrection. And so as Catholics, we can say, death, where is your sting with St. Paul? As Catholics, we can look at death with hope and confidence. And this is the hope and the light that we are to bring to the world in this context that we're setting here for the church's teaching regarding the gospel of life and end of life. And we need to distinguish between divine versus human teaching. Divine wisdom versus human wisdom. And recall that the human is subject to the divine. The origins of Catholic teaching on the end of life manifest God's will concretely. This is why it's great to be Catholic. Because the teachings of the church are laid out specifically to guide us in the practical events of our lives, especially those controversial ones. The church has something to say about human reproduction, contraception, abortion, marriage. The church and her tradition sets out concrete examples in the lives of the saints and in her teaching to guide us in these times of decision, of moral judgments. Thank God for the Catholic Church to give us this direction, especially in such a, a difficult area as the end of life moral theology that we'll be talking about. Another word on this with regard to Catholic health care 
I work with seven Catholic senior care providers in the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis. And I've had a lot of interaction with those institutions, wonderful Catholic institutions. But we have to remember that Catholic teaching is never a burden or subordinate to medical facility boards or the state or national departments of health or secular health associations. The Catholic Church is where hospitals originated, right? The Catholic Church knows a thing or two about health care, but we see health care in the context of care of a body and soul. And this is a great burden on Catholic hospitals and clinics, but it is an easy burden because it has to do with living out our Catholic identity to the fullest and not being distracted by things that may keep us from diligently adhering to the gospel of life and promoting this gospel of life in compassion and love. It's about witnessing. Yes, even being a martyr, which is what the word witness comes from. From being a martyr, that is a witness to the truth, a witness to love. And we should ask ourselves, how are Catholic health care providers connecting with local bishops? That's the work I'm doing, for example, in the archdiocese, is connecting these seven Catholic senior care providers with the bishop, with the local bishop. Bishop Callahan here has a wonderful collaboration with the Catholic hospitals and health care facilities in his diocese here. This is critically important for us as we move into such challenges that really are an affront to the dignity of the human person. Now this cartoon is just to illustrate that we can't let processes and technology cloud our vision of care and the dignity of the human person. We cannot let process and technology get in the way and distract us from compassion and love and respect for the human person, especially at the end of life, especially when life is at its weakest. I think I've covered this uh, point about the natural law already, that really, although we're talking especially about Catholic health care here, Catholic health care needs to lead the way with regard to end of life teaching, but this message is for all hospitals, for all in health care, for all people, not just Catholics. And so the teaching of the church regarding the end of life is a beautiful teaching. And let us commit ourselves to this obligation to protect human life. And so, as John Paul says in the Gospel of Life, the church's ethical standards flow from her teaching on the dignity of the human persons. The dignity of the human person And what is that dignity? We're made in the image and likeness of God. Declaration on Euthanasia. Human life is the basis of all goods and is the necessary source and condition of every human activity and of all society. And so John Paul says in Evangelium Vitae, the gospel of life, that life is always a good. Always a good. No matter how weak, not taking into account whether they're productive in the eyes of the world, the quality of life, so to speak. The dignity of life is not linked only to the origin, but to the end. I like to call the end of life issues the other pro-life issue. We've done a good job identifying the evil of abortion. And the church is known for its stance on this. But we can do more with regard to expounding the church's opposition to euthanasia. How the church values human life from conception to natural death. And so it is that other pro-life issue that we're talking about tonight. Now as we start to move into our discussion here of what the church does teach, setting this context of the dignity of the human person, the natural law and the church's teaching and the divine origin of that teaching. I wanted to address a term that's often used regarding patients in healthcare. 
And that is, and it's used in the ethical context especially, and it is patient autonomy. This is put forward as sort of a, an absolute in many cases in healthcare, especially secular healthcare. But when I, I thought about this word, it's kind of cold. It kind of suggests sort of an isolation. Almost suggests that a sort of subjectivism that I and I alone will make this call for myself and will shut out all else. I have an absolute right to make any and all decisions about my end of life treatments. But that's not entirely a Catholic perspective. It's close, but it's not absolute. Patient autonomy, as I say here, is not absolute, but morality must be determined by objective standards applied to concrete fact situations. And so the idea here is that as Catholics, we look to an objective teaching of the church regarding what accounts for the dignity of the human person. How can I make sure that I'm conforming most closely to Christ and his will? This is the approach that the Catholic Church takes to patient autonomy. It's not absolute. It's the same thing as the church's teaching on conscience, isn't it? It isn't enough just to say, well, I'll just follow my conscience, and I'm okay with God. Yes, but we have a duty to have what? An informed conscience, a rightly formed conscience, according to this objective truth that is elucidated by the church. Does that make sense? So this patient autonomy needs to be taken with a grain of salt, I would submit to you tonight. And so I would suggest that a better term or approach to this in setting the context is, is kind of a Christian personalism. Personalism. Well, I don't know. There, maybe there's better suggestions from the crowd tonight. But personalism gets more at the holistic care of the person in body and soul. And that we're not just autonomous. We are made for relationship with God, with our neighbor. We're connected, aren't we? We're the body of Christ, aren't we? And so, personalism gets more at this image of the Trinity. God is a community. There is, even God is not in isolation. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Perfect love communicated at all times, always between the three persons. And so I would suggest to you that Catholic health care especially, and as Catholics looking at the context of the gospel of life and end-of-life teaching, that we look at this in terms of Christian personalism. We're paying attention to the needs of the person, the human person in his and her full dignity with regard to Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And so the Catholic perspective places the human person and their good ahead of all else. Ahead of efficiencies, ahead of process, inconvenience. This is what distinguishes us this is where the rubber hits the pavement regarding Catholics and Catholic health care and the dignity of the human person. In proclaiming the gospel of life, then, the next move, John Paul II says it is, is especially pressing because of the extraordinary increase and gravity of threats to the life of individuals and peoples, especially where life is weak and defenseless. In addition, to the ancient scourges of poverty, hunger, endemic diseases, violence, and war, new threats are emerging on an alarmingly vast scale. And so, Pope John Paul II sees threats to this gospel of life, threats to the human person that are out there today. This isn't a cause for fear. This isn't even being negative. This is merely acknowledging the Christian reality that in living out our faith, we, were, we will face tribulation, as our Lord said. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And so, of course, there are threats to human dignity. Well, what are a few of them? I'm not going to go to these, into these in details. You know what these are, but they need to be stated because these threats are really at the root there are the philosophies, if you will, that are behind the errors that come up 
regarding end-of-life teaching of the church. Relativism. That is to say, all truth is relative. The truth is what I make of it. You can have your truth and I can have mine. There are no moral absolutes. Right? That's, that's the relativist. And it really fits well with materialism, with seeing the material and the productive and the utilitarian, that is to say, the productivity, the usefulness, is really what matters, not the being of the person. We are good and in God's image. And so because we are, because we exist, we are good. And this is the profound truth about the gospel of life. This is the profound truth that Christ reveals to us about ourselves, that we are inherently valuable. We are inherently worthwhile to God. The materialist, the utilitarian, sees a human person as a tool, that when they're not productive anymore, they can be set aside. If they're weak, we can take advantage of that. If they're expensive, eh, we have to make choices, right? And so this relativism is really at the root, and John Paul II really dwells on this in Veritate Splendor and also the Gospel of Life as being a source of many of the evils. We can't go through them all, but I wanted to bring this out as one of the main threats to human dignity. But one little quip I'd like to make about the relativists, even though they assert that there are no moral absolutes, they forget that they themselves are asserting an absolute statement, aren't they? The question is, what is the truth? Other threats to human life and dignity. Physician-assisted suicide. This is a euphemism for legalized murder. Prior to 2000, just to go around the horn on this a little bit, Oregon, Washington, Vermont have laws allowing physician-assisted suicide. Prior to 2000, ballot measures to legalize assisted suicide and euthanasia were defeated in California, Michigan, Washington, and Maine. But it's come up, hasn't it? It's, they're trying to get it through. The Massachusetts Death with Dignity Initiative, a ballot measure to legalize physician-assisted suicide, was narrowly defeated in a remarkable come-from-behind effort in the state's 2012 general election with 51% of voters against the proposal. What has happened to our culture? This is what John Paul II calls the, the culture of death, right? in the gospel life, the culture of death. So my point in this is, you know, we're not going to go through all kinds of examples, but it's, it's here already in law where the threats to human dignity reside. It's here already. In Montana, a physician may now raise a defense of consent if charged with assisting in a suicide through a trial court ruling in December 6 of 2009. So Montana's kind of on the border. They don't, they're not quite sure what they're going to do. So although it's only rock solid in a few states, it's, it's coming. Unless we're there to fight against this culture of death as a culture of life, right? As John Paul II emphasizes at the end of his encyclical, we are to defend and respect every human life and stand up strong and assert our Catholic identity. In our case law, you may be familiar with the Cruzan case. This came out exactly when I was beginning law school in 1990. I've dated myself. The Nancy Cruzan case was very similar to the Terry Schiavo case. She had been in a coma for almost eight years, but was not dying and not deteriorating. The courts allowed food and water to be discontinued, and 12 days later, on the day after Christmas, she died. Note well that she did not die of the coma. She died of starvation. And she was 33. In this case, 
which was first decided against the family, the family went back and found more proof that Nancy Cruzan would have wanted her life support terminated. And eventually they want a court order to have her removed from life support. So it's in our case law. It's there. Are there threats to human dignity? Is euthanasia dangerously entering into our culture? Absolutely. I could go on and on about these, and we'll talk a little bit about Terry Schiavo as well. But make no mistake, even in our jurisprudence, the right to life is not being respected. Not only on the front end of life, but it's also affecting the end of life. We'll also talk a bit later about how the pulsed approach, provider orders for life-sustaining treatment, can also be a threat to the dignity of the human person. And also along the lines of the HHS mandate illustrates that Catholic ethics are not necessarily part of the secular nationalized health care approach. And so we need to be very wise and careful in how we keep watch of things coming down the pike regarding health care reform. And whether or not as Catholics our ability to live out and practice our faith in how we care for individuals will be respected or not. Does that make sense? It's not a political statement. That's a Catholic statement. It's a moral statement. And so we need to stand up, as the bishops have unanimously, against this affront to religious freedom, which pertains very directly to Catholic health care. We could go on and on about the threats to the dignity of the human person, but I hope this suffices to give you some examples of some of the areas and the philosophies that are behind this. All right. Now we're into part two. That was just all context. <laughs> Are you awake out there? All right. You know, it is late. It's hard, isn't it? I teach a class uh, in, uh, at the St. Paul Seminary, and it starts, the lecture starts at 8 o'clock in the evening. So I've really gotten good at keeping people entertained, but at least I will stand for you up here, and I will keep moving around and raising my voice and invite you to go back to the wonderful table back there with treats to, to stay awake if need be. Again, I appreciate your attention. But this is so important, isn't it? God is the sole Lord of this life. Man cannot do with it as he wills. Very blunt and straightforward by our Holy Father in the Gospel of Life. It is a gift that we are to protect. So this is part of the church's teaching when we say, Thou shalt not kill. Evangelium Vitae. I confirm that the direct and voluntary killing of an innocent human being is always gravely immoral. There's our starting point with regard to Catholic teaching regarding end of life. Of course, killing of the innocent is immoral always and everywhere. It's what we call an intrinsic evil. The intention and circumstances can't change that. It is never permissible to take the life intentionally of an innocent human person. No one can arbitrarily choose whether to live or die. The absolute master of such a decision is the creator alone. Note 47. That may seem very obvious, but many people approach the end of life in discussing things and asking me questions in terms of, well, that's my decision. Isn't it? Whether I live or die? No. Not exactly. And we'll explore that as we look at the church's principles here that we apply. Human life finds itself most vulnerable when it enters the world and when it leaves the realm of time to embark upon eternity. The Word of God frequently repeats the call to show care and respect, above all where life is undermined by sickness and old age. What is needed at the end of life is love. Not necessarily a pulling of the plug. Is that compassion? Of course not. As Catholics, what we provide at the end of life is love, especially when one is most vulnerable. What else about the initial principles of Catholic moral teaching? Well, we need to pay attention not only to the body, but the soul. 
We turn to the church for sound moral direction. Hopefully a, a, a local pastor, the priest, the physician, hopefully at a Catholic hospital, if at all possible. We turn to the church for sound moral teaching, and that's what we're doing tonight. For nourishment and healing through the sacraments of Eucharist, reconciliation and anointing. The church encourages us to recognize the spiritual needs as much or more as the physical, than the physical needs when we're looking at one who is coming close to the threshold of life after life. Holy Father continues. And so there's a temptation to have recourse to what is called mercy killing or euthanasia. To take control of death and bring it about before it's time. Ending one's own life or the life of others. And so let's look at our definitions. Let's get our definitions straight. What is euthanasia? Euthanasia, he says, in the strict sense is understood to be an action or omission which of itself and by intention causes death with the purpose of eliminating all suffering. And that's the, that's the rub, isn't it? Right here. Eliminating all suffering is the purpose. The error of consequentialism. We're going to end your life for the good end of ending suffering. Doesn't that sound good? This is, this is the slipperiness of this euthanasia issue, is that it seems merciful, but in fact it's quite the opposite. Very clear definition for us to build our foundation on regarding the basic catechesis of church teaching on end of life. And we've said this already, but euthanasia arises from this culture of death. So we've already set the context of the threats to the human dignity of the person being materialism and relativism. And he defines further that confirming that euthanasia is a grave violation of the law of God since it is the deliberate and morally unacceptable killing of a human person. And this is important. Depending on the circumstances, this practice involves the malice proper to suicide or murder. And you'll have to remember that term circumstances because circumstances are critical, absolutely critical, for determining whether certain treatments or withholding of treatments at end of life are morally permissible or euthanasia. Our current pope hasn't been pope very long, so lots of our quotes have to come from when he's before pope. And he said that the future pope denounced euthanasia. This pope denounced euthanasia and assisted suicide, calling it a culture of discarding the elderly. And in Argentina, he admitted that there is clandestine euthanasia. Today, elderly people are discarded when in reality they are the seat of wisdom of the society. I just thought it's fitting for us to put a quote from our current pope on this important issue. I liked his attitude though here, to go a little lighter. I am beginning old age and I will not resist it. How's that? That's good. I am prepared. I am prepared. And I would like to be like a vintage wine. Not one gone sour. Can't you just see him saying that? So there you go. All right. Just a little bit of moral philosophy, if you will tolerate me for another minute. When we look at a moral act, we are going to be talking about a moral act here, the act of caring for those who are at the end of life. The Catholic Church, you'll find this in the Catechism, looks at three important components for the moral act. The first is the object. That's kind of a, a technical scholastic term, which only means what kind of act are we talking about here? What's the nature of the act? Okay? The object of the act of a human person. What is this on about? What type of act is this? The second is the intention. That's easy to understand. What's the purpose? What's the motivation for the action? Third, we have circumstances. An act done in certain context. 
this is going to be critical for us, especially when looking at end of life. And this is a, a comment from Veritas de Splendor that some acts are incapable of being ordered to God. They're immoral simply because the act itself cannot be possibly ordered to God. Murder would be an example of that. Abortion would be an example of that. Contraception would be an example of that. Homosexual acts would be an example of that. There are some kinds of acts that no matter what the intention or circumstances are always immoral. Always immoral. Gravely immoral. It used to be called, and still is actually, mortal sin. So the moral act has these three important components that we need to keep in mind as we're moving through what the church teaches about end of life. And with this objective approach to morality that our church takes, we need to be wary of the idea that, well, I just want to relieve their suffering. That is a good intention, isn't it? That's one of the components. There's a good intention. But it can't be ordered to God when we're taking a human life, right? It can't be good. So a good intention does not make good make behavior intrinsically evil, good or just. No matter how good your intention is, perceived or otherwise, it can't make something intrinsically evil, as we've just defined euthanasia to be, moral or just. And the scripture of this is, we can never do evil so good may come of it. Romans 3.8. And so this is the era of consequentialism, isn't it? We've heard of consequentialism. The end justifies the means. We need to be wary of this because this is a main argument that we'll hear from the relativists and those who don't understand the church's teaching regarding end of life and its true import on the dignity of the human person. Is They'll resort to good intentions, but they will be doing something that is intrinsically evil. Does that make sense? I think we're close to break time. That's good news, isn't it? Let me just, uh, in fact, recommend that we take our, where's Chris? Is this a good time for a stretch break? Why don't we take uh, a, a four minute stretch break and we'll jump into Ordinary and extraordinary means of treatment. The, the heart and soul of the, of the talk. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The church, in her moral teaching, makes the distinction between ordinary, or another way of saying ordinary is proportionate, means of treatment, an extraordinary or disproportionate means of treatment at the end of life. In the Declaration on Euthanasia, ordinary care means and refers to the normal care due to the sick person. A person has a moral obligation to use ordinary or proportionate means of preserving his or her life. This is from ERD 56, the Ethical and Religious Directives. Proportionate means are those that in the judgment of the patient offer a reasonable hope of benefit and do not entail an excessive burden or impose excessive expense, excessive expense on family or the community. Ordinary. ordinary or proportionate means. All are morally obligated to use ordinary or proportionate means of preserving life. So, first and foremost, what does that mean, Deacon? Well, nutrition and hydration must be provided. If we walk out of here with anything, remembering that nutrition and hydration constitutes ordinary care that must always be provided. And as Pope John Paul II said in 2004, the administration of food and water, even when provided by artificial means, always represents a natural means of preserving life and not a medical act. Note that the Holy Father was not saying that no medical assistance is needed to place and maintain, for example, a feeding tube, but that food and water are natural necessities of the human condition. This is what he means when he says it's not a medical act, because it's ordered to the basic 
sustenance of human life. It's absolutely necessary. That's the sense in which he means that it's a natural means of preserving life. Everybody needs food and water. And how it is given could be artificial or it could be naturally through the mouth. Food and water should generally be provided to all patients regardless of their cognitive condition, regardless of their mental condition. Hydration and nutrition are not morally obligatory when either they bring no comfort to a person who is imminently dying or they cannot be assimilated by a person's body. So that's what we run into with aspiration, pneumonia, and infections and, and such. This is an ERD five in the intro. In principle, there is an obligation to provide patients with food and water, including medically assisted nutrition and hydration for those who cannot take food orally. And ERD Directive 58 continues, or would cause significant physical discomfort, for example, resulting from complications in the use of the means employed. For instance, as a patient draws close to inevitable death from an underlying progressive and fatal condition, certain measures to provide nutrition and hydration may become excessively burdensome, and therefore not obligatory in light of their very limited ability to prolong life or provide comfort. And here's that quote for you to, to reread as we ponder this. So what is important here is even nutrition and hydration reach a point where they become disproportionate means at the very end of life, don't they? Even nutrition and hydration, you know, as we get older, we eat less. Well, I wish we did. I, mean, I guess I can't really say that. But generally, as we get older, we tend to need less intake to sustain us. Well, that's especially true as, as a person enters into uh, the dying stages. The person is going to need less and less and desire less and less as organs shut down, as with dementia, for example, the, the centers of the brain that, that spark hunger uh, begin to deteriorate. It's not uncommon for a person to eat less and drink less as they near death. So even artificial nutrition and hydration are subject to a reasonableness standard of whether it's proportionate or disproportionate. There comes a time when artificial hydration may actually be complicating things at the very end of life. And this is where we need to turn to physicians and to our caregivers, the professionals in healthcare, to advise and to explain what is needed and what's really helping the patient at this point. Even if death is thought imminent, the ordinary care owed to a sick person cannot be legitimately interrupted. This is from the catechism. So, if a person is responding well and is accepting nutrition and hydration, even up to the point of death, we need to continue providing it to the person so that they're sustained. We don't want to starve people to death. So this is, let's not overthink this. <laughs> Artificial or natural nutrition and hydration must always be provided until it becomes unreasonable or becomes unhelpful, overly burdensome, where it becomes disproportionate, unreasonable. In sum, we must care for basic life-sustaining needs of food and water and not omit or do anything that causes death. Ordinary care is interrupted only to give way to natural death caused by something other than lack of nutrition and hydration. We don't want people dying because of a lack of nutrition and hydration. People will be dying from the underlying condition that's taking their life, whatever that may be. And so when we're talking about ordinary and extraordinary, our nomenclature here requires us to look at ordinary meaning required and extraordinary means are optional. How's that for straightforward? Extraordinary means are optional. All are morally obligated to use ordinary or proportionate means of preserving life. I have to pause here because I do teach a lot of aspects of moral theology in other areas. End of life is, is difficult because it's very unsatisfying 
to people who are listening to it, especially those who are, are maybe hearing some of this for the first time or don't understand these concepts well, because in the end, what I'm leaving you with tonight are principles to be applied to actual circumstances that will arise in the future. Don't have an answer for you definitively on this or that condition. Deacon, isn't it always the case that this is extraordinary? Well, no, it's not. A ventilator sometimes is extraordinary means when you look at a case, and sometimes it would be ordinary or proportionate means. For example, a priest I know got pneumonia, very bad pneumonia. He had to go in to the hospital, and he was actually had to go on a ventilator. I'm glad he didn't have a pulse saying, don't put me on a ventilator, because this was a transitory pathology he was experiencing. He could get better. So the ventilator helped him for a while, and then they took him off of it. So again, it can be proportionate, reasonable, and it can be, any, and this was an elderly priest, a very elderly priest, or it could be disproportionate. It could be extraordinary means in other circumstances where a person is, is imminently dying, for example. One is not morally obligated to use extraordinary or disproportionate means of preserving life. Okay, so what do we mean by extraordinary or disproportionate treatments? A person may forego extraordinary or disproportionate means of preserving life. Disproportionate means are those that in the patient's judgment do not offer a reasonable hope of benefit or entail an excessive burden or impose excessive expense in the family or community. And so here's, I guess, my example already. An example of a ventilator could be proportionate the ordinary means for a reversible condition. <laughs> and so the point here, it says first we're going to run some tests to help pay off this machine. <laughs> you know, we don't have to use all the technology that's out there, that's available you know, at the end of life. You know, we don't, as Catholics, as Bishop rightly said in the beginning, you know, there's this misimpression that Catholics are saying, you have to employ every kind of means possible in order to stay alive. Well, I can leave you with this general principle. It's a lot more reasonable for someone who is, say, oh, 35 and a father of six, who may be facing an unlikely recovery and maybe some experimental treatments, some new gadgets, Maybe it's worth trying that because there's obligations to others, right? It's not wrong for someone in circumstances to use what might be called disproportionate means or, right, that kind of thing, extraordinary means. But a person who's towards the end of life, the same kind of prognosis and treatment may be something they want to forego. So, for example, a person may judge in good conscience that the pain and difficulty of a aggressive treatment for terminal cancer is too much to bear and thus decide to forego that treatment. Extraordinary means of preserving life are optional and legitimate to refuse. This is when the treatment ceases to be a benefit or it becomes burdensome, overly burdensome. So it needs to be determined whether the means of treatment available are objectively proportionate to the prospects for improvement. It's a balancing test. Friends, this is a prudential judgment. I can't send you away with absolutes when it comes down to the application of the principles. I just can't. It depends on the circumstances. It depends on the circumstances of the person's age and their terminal condition or not, the circumstances of their family. The church gives us various benchmarks to look at regarding these end-of-life decisions, but they are in the end prudential judgments, which means given all the facts that we know of, given the doctor's best characterization of the prognosis, Applying the teaching of the church, this is what I think she would want or he would want, and this is what we're going to do. Right? In a sense, again, as I say in moral theology, 
I'm not going to be leaving you very consoled in some ways if you're looking for something that's rock solid about a certain case you may have in your mind or about ourselves and what we're thinking about what we may face in the future. But what we do have are very solid principles, very solid teachings in the ethical and religious directives to help us make these determinations, to help make these judgments. It really shows how reasonable the church is. It's not extreme on one hand with regard to saying, you have to try everything to stay alive. And on the other hand, the church is saying, don't starve people to death. Don't deprive them of nutrition and hydration when, they, when it's helping them, when, it, when they need it, right? It's reasonable. Virtue, it, virtue is in the mean. Aristotle said it, Aquinas said it, and it's still right there in the teaching, moral teaching of the church today. For example, a chemo treatment for a very elderly person could constitute disproportionate means. But for a young person, it may be proportionate. The judgment that a particular means is either proportionate or disproportionate has to be made in light of the personal, familial, economic, and social circumstances of each individual patient. And so that means that an a priori or ahead of time list of treatments that would be classified as always and everywhere proportionate or disproportionate can't be made. I can't give you that. The church can't give you that. Does that make sense? So really we apply this standard of proportionate or disproportionate to any of these treatments that are being considered. This is what the church teaches regarding this distinction. Discontinuing medical procedures that are burdensome, dangerous, extraordinary, or disproportionate to the expected outcome can be legitimate, says the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's the refusal of overzealous treatment. And so here, one doesn't will to cause one's death. One's inability to impede it is merely accepted. It's an acceptance of one's terminal condition. It's an acceptance of God is calling me now very soon to eternal life. So omission of ordinary means is euthanasia. Omission of extraordinary means is not euthanasia. In medicine, what do we mean by ordinary? We mean that it's scientifically established, that it's statistically successful and reasonably available. If any of these conditions is lacking, it generally means that it's considered to be extraordinary. Pope Pius XII gave an expression of this difference when he said that normally one is held to use only ordinary means according to the circumstances a person places, times, and culture. That is to say, means that do not involve a grave burden for oneself or another. A stricter obligation would be too burdensome for most people and would render the attainment of the higher, more important good too difficult. Life, health, all temporal activities are in fact subordinated to spiritual ends. And so don't confuse proportionate means with proportionalism, which is a moral theology error. Proportionalism means that we're going to weigh the relative evils that we might do in proportion to some good end. It's kind of consequentialism. That's not what we mean. We mean this in the medical clinical context. Proportionate means means reasonable. Okay? Just to make a, a distinction there. We're not talking about proportionalism. Do not resuscitate. A do not resuscitate order is permissible in Catholic teaching. It's subject to the same analysis that we just made. A DNR order is morally permissible if one can judge that CPR is excessively burdensome for this particular patient, taking into account the things we've talked about physical and moral resources, or the CPR imposes excessive burdens on the person. This is just applying ERD number 58. So a do not resuscitate order is subject to the same analysis. There are cases where that could be euthanasia. There are cases where it's absolutely reasonable. Okay? And so we want to avoid extremes. And I already mentioned this. We want to avoid the extremes of doing everything we can no matter what, and not providing someone the basic sustenance of life.
Thank God for technology, right? <laughs> We've come a long ways. It says, and this is Ralph, your anesthesiologist. And so the point that we're making here is a lead-in to pain medication. We've made advances, haven't we? This is a great blessing. The church sees the use of painkillers as a good thing, as a very necessary thing, to alleviate the sufferings of the dying, even at the risk of shortening their days. Okay? This can be morally in conformity with human dignity if death is not willed as an end, but only foreseen and tolerated as inevitable. And so, as one increases morphine and sedates someone, to relieve them of pain, this can have a secondary, or what we call in moral theology, a double effect of also shortening someone's life. But in Catholic theology, this is permissible if it's not being done to hasten a person's death and to kill them. An important distinction. But also, again, shows the reasonableness what the church is teaching with regard to this sort of matter with pain medication. It is an easily abusable area, isn't it? But it's clear that we need to make sure that we don't impose redemptive suffering on people who may not want it, right? Oh, come on, offer it up, Jim. We don't want to do that. There are some that may forego it for that purpose. God bless them. God bless them. We need that. But it's also important for us to know that there will be a double effect for cases where large amounts or increasing amounts of, of pain-killing uh, medication is, is required. A word about the persistent vegetative state. And of course, we don't like the word vegetative, do we? Because we're talking about a human person. And John Paul II said in 2004, a person, even if seriously ill or disabled in the exercise of his highest functions, is and always will be a person, and never a vegetable. In fact, we've seen recent studies, I can't get into this in detail, that reveal an awareness on the part of people who are in the so-called persistent vegetative state, and under an MRI, showed the same kind of brain activity in response to questions as so-called normal patients. And so the much-feared prison situation or scenario of a person who can't manifest their consciousness in the way that we normally do may well be conscious of what's going on around them. And so we have the Terry Schiavo case where her life support was removed. She was not dying. But a court order was made to remove artificial nutrition and hydration from her on the demands of her guardian. And so she was starved to death. She was deprived of nutrition and hydration. She was not dying. Is this a difficult and precarious existence? Is it a mystery when we look upon Christ on the cross? Similarly, when we see someone in Terry's state? Absolutely. It's an extreme case. But it's also one that manifests the Catholic approach versus the secularist approach, the materialist approach, the proportionalist approach that says a person's quality of life is what matters. And that's it. When in fact, she has dignity and a right to life, no matter how seemingly productive on the outside it may be. Due to time, now I'm going to move to the solution. The solution, you may think to yourself right now, Deacon, okay, that's a lot of stuff. You've covered a lot of ground. And it's all jumbled in my head. How do I deal with this? How as Catholics do we approach the end of life in a way that is solid, in a way that allows these decisions to be made according to all that stuff you just said, Deacon? So that we know the difference between ordinary and extraordinary treatment. So we look at those, at those potential treatments I might receive properly in accordance with the church's direction. And the answer is an advanced directive, a Catholic advanced directive with power of attorney, appointing a health care agent, giving someone trustworthy who will survive you especially the power to help make those decisions if you're incapacitated and a document that will set out clearly 
because we're not all moral theologians. I wouldn't want to write my own document. A document that sets out, here are the basic principles of the ethical and religious directives. Apply these principles to me if I'm incapacitated and you've got to make decisions about whether to give me this or that treatment, right? So it also prevents your appointed healthcare agent from falling into fear of like, well, I've got to make all these decisions. And I don't know how, what the standards are. Well, they're there in the advanced directive. So an advanced directive with power of attorney is the answer. It's the Catholic answer to addressing these prudential judgments that need to be made at the end of life. An advanced directive is an intrinsically sound paradigm because it becomes operative only when the terminal conditions and pathologies are manifesting themselves. When a person is incapacitated, there'll be someone there to make decisions for you that's trustworthy. And so we're applying Catholic ethical principles to actual situations. So what are the components of an advanced directive? Two main components. The designation of a health care agent and instructions for deciding on health care treatments. We're working on this right now with the bishop and with the Wisconsin Catholic Conference to create a form that could be used, hopefully, statewide to make this easy, to make it consistent. So you would enter your name and date. You enter the name of the designated health care agent. You've got the health care instructions provided there for you. And again, the point to an advanced directive is not to be very specific. I know a lawyer who's been writing advanced directives for 30 years. Great Catholic lawyer in the Twin Cities. Great guy. Awesome. But he was under the impression that being as specific as possible was the best approach to an advanced directive, being a thorough attorney, right? But in fact, what we want are to, and the NCBC recommends this explicitly, that we give general directives, the principles that we've been talking about for application in the actual circumstances. An option is there for organ donation, a signature with two witnesses also signing, and a place to designate the, dis the dissemination of copies to those who need it. Your healthcare agents, your doctor, your priest, the hospital that you want to go to, your doctor. The more the merrier. Right? Family members, thank you. So this is it in a nutshell. It's pretty easy, isn't it? That's pretty straightforward. That's doable, isn't it? This is what uh, is available in many states. Hospitals provide them. Fran Mayo Franciscan has a durable power of attorney. They do a great job with uh, making sure as many people as possible that come in for care, you know, designate that agent. It's a great example to us. And so uh, this is an important document that I'd like to leave you with uh, as a, a concrete thing that we can do. It's good to talk about the gospel of life, good to talk about the church's teachings. We can't possibly do them justice here tonight, uh, but we can at least touch on the main components and then leave you with something concrete, something concrete to go away with. Now, when should we fill one out? Well, don't wait too long, okay? But the sooner the better. The sooner the better. It's also called an advanced medical directive or durable power of attorney for health care. But these are legal documents that take effect once you move into a terminal condition or are incapacitated. And so the things that we put in there, kind of less is more. You have the form, you go in, you sign it, you designate your healthcare agents, and you're set. One point of confusion uh, sometimes is, what about a living will? This, this term comes up all the time. A living will isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it has its origins kind of with the right to die crowd, to be honest. A living will could be whatever the attorney that you sit down with to write one up makes it out to be, right? I doubt that you're going to find many that are going to set out the ethical and religious directives. So uh, a living will uh, you know, may or may not be consistent with Catholic teaching. We want to move people towards this advanced directive approach. And this approach is the best document to date that we've been able to come up with as a church that can address these extant circumstances that can arise in the future without trying to make those calls too soon or ahead of time. Which leads us to POLST,
which I'm going to just only take a few minutes with. I wanted to spend more time on this tonight, but just to give you a heads up. A pulsed form stands for physician or provider orders for life-sustaining treatments. What is a pulsed? Well, it's a one-page form, front and back, with check boxes regarding end-of-life choices. They're binding medical orders. They need not be signed by the patient. It's optional. And originated in Oregon. And is really something that originated from those who were very adamant about the right to die. However, uh, while it's promoted by the Compassion and Choices Society, the desire with Pulsed is to try to find something really concrete that designates the treatments for this patient as they move from one treatment setting to another. So there's a good intention behind this. And in fact, a genuine concern that people's wishes be respected uh, when you know, moving from home to the hospital or an EMS situation where someone is down on the floor and the EMS show up, what do I do? And so the idea would be this binding medical order would be on the refrigerator and the EMS personnel would follow that. Okay? So that's the, that's the intention behind it. This is very quickly sort of what it looks like. Okay? You have sections on a do not resuscitate, a section regarding antibiotics, a section allowing you to refuse nutrition and hydration, and various levels of treatment. This form tries to summarize in one page decisions about future treatments. And what I want to leave with you tonight is that according to the bishops of Minnesota and Wisconsin so far, and the NCBC, the POLST model is a flawed model because circumstances can determine whether an act is morally sound or is euthanasia. I hope that makes some sense to you after what we've talked about that it depends on the circumstances as to what treatments we apply, right? So we don't want a designation of future treatments outside of the actual circumstances of the health conditions, okay? We don't want to designate whether or not I want to be on a ventilator, whether or not I want antibiotics, when I don't know what my condition is going to be a year from now or even three months from now. Does that make sense? So that's the danger with pulsed. The idea here is that we can't predict the future. Even very good doctors, right? We don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. And so the pulsed paradigm is intrinsically flawed, quoting this brilliant ethics and medics document from February of 2013. Uh, I don't know. I don't know who wrote this. Determining whether treatments are proportionate or disproportionate necessarily requires an analysis of the, of the actual clinical condition of the patient in the particular circumstances, right? Right. That's, that's what we've talked about tonight. Proportionate or disproportionate. How do you know? Well, boom, 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 boom. Here's the circumstances. Here's the prognosis. Here's the medical condition of the person. So here's the crux of the pulse issue. Circumstances can determine whether an act is morally sound or is euthanasia. Remember when we quoted John Paul II from the beginning, depending on the circumstances, the actions could be tantamount to suicide or murder. So this is important, the circumstances. Wisconsin bishops, just a quick quote. Because we cannot predict the future, it is difficult to determine in advance whether specific medical treatments from an ethical perspective are absolutely necessary or optional. Pulsed over simplifies these decisions and bears the real risk that an indication may be made on it to withhold a treatment that in particular circumstances might be an act of euthanasia. That sounds similar to what the Minnesota bishops are saying. And I, I actually played a role in writing of the Minnesota bishops document. The form does not reflect the patient's underlying rationale for weighing treatment options that would inform real-time decisions in changing circumstances. From a Catholic perspective, making a morally sound decision regarding end-of-life care calls for informed consent based on information related to the actual circumstances and medical conditions at a particular moment. Okay? So you're getting the drift here. And so this is why Pulsed is something to be avoided. And there are many different problems with it. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, you know, there's a lot that can be said. 
and I've spent a lot of time on Pulse working with uh, Bishop and, and uh, male Franciscan here on, on Pulse, making, making good progress on analyzing it. Uh, but the problem is that the error intrinsic to Pulse is that the Pulse paradigm pre-sins, or in other words, doesn't take into account the actual circumstances and their evolution, which are indispensable for correct moral judgments at the end of life. Right? So this is the problem with Pulsed. There's something really enticing about Pulsed. Because we would like to just reduce this to a form and say, this is what you do. Done. Boom. Family, no fights, no feuds. Don't have to get everybody together and talk about it. It's kind of, you know, calling for a personalism approach, right? As opposed to a pulsed approach. One that isn't just process and efficiency and cost savings. Not to mention the kind of abuse that could come from a mandatory pulsed form being used in the healthcare system. What we, what we want to do as Catholics is approach things from a personalist standpoint. Taking into account the circumstances as they're happening with a dedicated healthcare agent. And so the treatment choices are kind of like a simplistic checklist. That's just not how medical treatments are made or decided upon. And so the NCBC, we urge Catholic healthcare institutions to refuse to accept or use pulsed forms. This prescription won't make you feel better, but it will stop your whining and make everyone else feel better. <laughs> I just threw that in because I thought it was funny. <laughs> okay, so what's the Catholic solution to Pulse to, to wind things up now? I see Chris is standing up. That's the universal sign of hurry up, Deacon. No, I'm kidding. Just kidding. Outpatient DNR medical orders are acceptable, right? A, a, a do not resuscitate or no CPR order is consistent with Catholic moral teaching. And it has to do with something in the future, right? But that decision can be made. That decision can be made that a person... Uh, that, that such a procedure would be so overly burdensome and harmful to a person who is towards the end of their life and has various conditions, health conditions, where it could legitimately be issued, right? An outpatient for someone in the home, right? So what we're recommending is that uh, an advanced directive, a durable power of attorney, be executed, of course. This is what we do as Catholics. And we need to promote this. What the bishop is has been so great about is promoting and getting behind this notion of educating and providing programs out there, uh, the vital conversations to educate people in parishes and provide forms for them to use to use this advanced directive. And so we're leading the way really in this sort of ground zero uh, regarding Pulse by emphasizing the need for advanced directives and pointing out that there, there is a solution for the situation where a person needs to have an outpatient medical order for do not resuscitate. So we think that's a good direction for one to go. Not pulsed, but to provide this kind of uh, medical order. And so, uh, some, some uh, constructive steps. Well, we want, to we want to educate, and we want Catholic health care and parishes to take a spiritual, clinical, ethical, and educational and strategic approach to how we can better educate people in our parishes about end of life, about end of life issues, and to get those advanced directives in the hands of people. That they can designate their, their person with power of attorney. There's a, there was a, a white paper written by the Catholic Medical Association that asked for, um, uh, that called upon parishes to even provide befrienders who would be willing to be a healthcare agent for someone. Because I get people coming out to me after these talks in parishes, and I've given a myriad of these. They'll come up and say, I want a healthcare agent, but I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody. I don't know who. So I thought it was great in this Catholic Medical Association white paper on Pulse that it suggested we need to have people in our parishes mobilized to be able to uh, address this important life issue. So that's it, gang. In sum, what we've done, we've done quite a tour tonight of taking a look at the origins of Catholic teaching, how euthanasia is a threat to human dignity, and the end of life decisions consider whether treatments are proportionate or disproportionate in the present circumstances, and that a Catholic advanced care directive with durable power of attorney can help ensure that the care is provided consistent with Catholic moral teaching 
and that we need to move away from pulsed as a silver bullet to taking care of future decisions. It's not a good way to go. So I want to thank you for your attention. And we have uh, probably about 12 minutes here for uh, some question and answer. Uh, thanks for your attention. I know it's been late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Let's see. Um, I think